Nintendo was in quite the hurry to get out titles featuring Rob at the launch of the NES in America. Evidently, it was quite difficult to come up with engaging concepts for the bulky peripheral. Development for Stack Up seemed to be quite rushed. Similar to Gyromite, the game had a Famicom adapter in the cart to save time in porting the Japanese version, called Robot Block. And, once again, the title screen remains untranslated. The music for the game, composed by Hiro Kazu Tanaka, is dated as May 5th, 1985 in the game's code, only a couple of months before the game was officially released in the States. Due to the long development period after the initial programming of NES carts, this would suggest a serious time crunch. It's my and many others' assertion that, rather than begin development as a fully-fledged title for Rob, StackUp started as a development tool for the robot and was hastily cobbled together to create something that somewhat resembled a game. The same rushed feeling can be said about Gyromite, but its added puzzle platformer aspect makes it feel much more finished. As such, rather than Stack Up's failing being the exception, it's more surprising that Gyromite was a playable, somewhat fun title. Gyromite has a clear sense of direction, allowing it to succeed where Stack Up fails. Rob's lack of feedback to the NES means that a player has to be very self-motivated in order to derive any joy from these games. As mentioned previously, Gyromite could easily be played with a second controller instead of Rob to the same effect. However, this would remove most of the point of Rob's existence. Stack Up required the same player motivation, but with even less structure surrounding the actual game. In the main game mode, Direct, a confusing layout is shown on screen. Dr. Hector takes up the bottom two thirds, while the top left is occupied by a string of words and numbers, and the top right shows two configurations of blocks. Essentially, the goal is to get your pile of blocks on Rob the Robot to match the pile shown on screen. That's right, similar to its counterpart, Stack Up came with a slew of accessories necessary to play the game as intended. Stack Up retailed for $34.99, a solid $5 markup over the more premium games in the original launch lineup, and a large enough hike to expect a solid game. The box came with a set of extra parts, including two hands, five trays, and five colored blocks, embossed with a silver Nintendo logo. The craftsmanship of these parts is quite good, as expected from Nintendo, a company that spent many of their prior years in toy manufacturing. As Jeremy Parrish points out in his Stack Up retrospective, there is a non-zero chance that these blocks were repurposed poker chips from Nintendo's prior history in the gambling industry, and I can definitely see it. The blocks have divots on the bottom to ensure that they fit securely with the others, as well as the tray that attached to Rob's base. The actual control of Rob changes as well. In Gyromite, there are only three height settings, whereas in Stack Up there are five, allowing Rob to pick up each block individually. With this understanding under our belts, let's get back to the actual gameplay of Stack Up. The main issue that arises with each and every mode in the game is the lack of feedback from Rob. Stack Up works off of the honor system. The player could verify that the stacks have been completed correctly or just bypass Rob entirely. Of course, this would defeat the entire purpose of the game. Without a real sense of motivation, Stack Up's whole premise simply falls apart. While later stages of direct mode do get somewhat challenging, it's hard to imagine anyone, child or adult, actually sitting through hours of the mind-numbing sound of Rob slowly moving a pile of blocks to various positions. The second game mode, Memory, is slightly more interesting. It essentially functions as a mini-programmable mode, where all movements are planned out in advance, requiring spatial reasoning skills to get the blocks to the next location in the fewest amount of button presses possible. It still suffers from the same drawbacks as Direct, but innovates enough to provide marginally more enjoyment. And I suppose it acts as a sort of preview to coding for kids who may have been interested in that. It may be a bit of a stretch, but I'm doing the best with what I've got here. Bingo mode is the most game-like aspect of Stack Up, although that isn't saying much. Once again, the player must move configurations of blocks to match what appears on screen, but in order to get an input to go through, they have to step on every button in the row or column lining up with the movement. There are two bugs that could interfere with this task. Spike, who moves randomly and kicks Hector off the platform if they come into contact with one another, and Flipper, who bounces across rows and columns, causing Rob to move in random ways and messing up progress. There are no lives, nor is there a timer in this mode, so Spike is little more than a mild inconvenience. However, Flipper can cause some real setbacks if the player gets too tunnel visioned. The two player mode gets rid of Flipper and basically becomes a free for all of who can get the most blocks to their side. 
At the end of the day though, the game is shallow. Again, there's no feedback whatsoever. The actual game serves as little more than a rulebook than an actual interactive experience. Stack Up is everything the NES was attempting not to be. A poor quality, expensive video game with little to no content. It's the very thing retailers were so fearful of when allowing Nintendo to set up in their stores. This fear was almost certainly recognized by Nintendo, as they pulled the game very shortly after the official NES launch in 1986. There are only five known prints of the game, stopping with the NES-GP print around late 1986 or early 87. This also contributes to the cost of the game in today's market. Anyone going for a full NES or black box set knows the struggles of finding a complete in box stack up, the second most expensive game only to Donkey Kong Jr. math. Gyromite also stopped with the round seal of quality prints as far as I can tell, meaning they halted production in late 87 or early 88. This essentially means that Rob was only out for about a year and a half after launch. Rob quietly faded away from the mainstream, providing a fantastic path for the NES's introduction to US markets but not a whole lot else. Since the 80s, Rob has cameoed in tons of first-party games as a nod to fans of Nintendo's early history, such as F-Zero GX and Zelda Majora's Mask 3D, as well as appearing as a playable character in Mario Kart DS and the Super Smash Bros. franchise. However, assessing the impact of the games themselves proves quite difficult. The Robot series of games have no real comparison by today's standards. If a company attempted to create a comparable peripheral, it would certainly not stick around for long in today's landscape. To put it simply, the honor system doesn't work for video games. Interactivity is the cornerstone of the medium, forgoing this in an era far before postmodern awareness of what it means to be a video game was a costly mistake. Of course, this wouldn't have happened if Nintendo didn't attempt to convert a developmental tool into a full-fledged launch title, but I suppose that's what happens. And so we bid adieu to our robot friend, and the first of two peripherals included in this project. Goodbye Rob, 